Now we are going to have the, also a discussion which usually is like a fad, yes, about energy consumption and stuff like that around, around mining, but let's focus on mining as a positive tool, yes, so we will invite uh, our four speakers, Aníbal Garrido as a moderator, Roselo López, Daniel Farmkin, and Ethan Vera, to I'll let you introduce Gracias. yourself. Welcome on stage. Hello, hello. So, the strategic role of mining for society and other industries? Wow, such a complex subject, right? Indeed. Well, thank you, Rosello, Ethan, and Daniel for being here with me. We're going to talk about mining and how it could help improve society in a complex world. So, let's begin talking about some numbers and figures. And uh, according to Bitcoin Mining Council Energy, consumption around BDC is 0.1% of world total electricity generation. For some, this is a huge figure. For others, this is the price that society is willing to pay for having a tool of freedom such Bitcoin. But that sounds money could represent really, really this price? Should this amount of energy that could supply an entire country at Switzerland uh, be used for a better reason than for energy just for mining? Or at the contrary, we need more miners, we need more power, we need more energy to make Bitcoin so much stronger than it is right now. Rosello, what do you think about it? Well. There is one thing that concerns me a lot about the way mining is today. It's too much centralized already. So this is a big problem. If you just count maybe 20 mining pools, they actually control probably like 85% of the hash rate at the moment. So answering your question, we need to decentralize more. We right. need miners mining uh, on a small scale in different parts of the world. And if I could suggest part of the world, let's shut up those guys that they say that mining is bad. It's because they don't understand what they are saying. We are only using 0.5% of the, the, the energy that yep. is wasted in the world. So how about if we mine maybe in Venezuela, mine maybe in El Salvador, mine in Angola, in Zimbabwe, mining countries that they are poor and they can have, their families can have 10 machines in their house. And there is no problem with electricity then. So we need more mine machines in different countries and not being controlled by maybe a VC corporation from China or a VC corporation from, from, from Switzerland. We need the poor people mining, not the rich people. That's my view on that. That's great. I completely agree with you, man. <laughs> so. Ethan, what, what else could you add yeah. to what Rosella said? Yeah, well, I, I think energy consumption has a very high correlation with human progress in civilization. And so we need to frame the argument that we should be consuming more energy as a civilization. Our end goal should be we're able to produce unlimited energy in the world. Hopefully that's all clean energy, and I think we are transitioning to that. Yeah. But that's the way we should frame it. Because as soon as we start getting into the argument against uh, Bitcoin fighters that uh, you know, it doesn't use that much energy or it's, you know, pretty renewable. I think we've already lost the argument. And so we really need to kind of flip it on its head. Um, energy consumption in the Bitcoin network benefits society. It improves our energy infrastructure systems. It adds dollars to a lot of countries around the globe. And so that's how we should be looking at it. Um, I do think that this issue will not pass uh, in the near future. Uh, Bitcoin has gone against many, uh, foes, I guess, in the past, uh, you know, funding terrorists, uh, black market money, but now we're going head to head with the most topical point around the world, which everyone cares about, climate change. And so it's going to be a long battle, but it's one that we can, I think, ultimately prevail. Um, at the same time, we need to be uh, making sure we're funneling investment into renewable energy sources, uh, nuclear energy, uh, hydro, wind, solar, and, and keep pushing that narrative. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Also, I think that the whole global warming stuff is uh, something that is concerning right now, and uh, we're going to talk about it in uh, just a few minutes. 
But Rosello said something about decentralization and, and technically that the, this whole power not, must not be in just one city, not just be in just one company. Talking about locations, we were talking about that behind stage, behind the scenes, and uh, where to set up a mining facility in a country that needs the help, that needs money, that hit, that, that finan financial support, uh, maybe, I don't know, Africa, maybe we are right now in Latin America, or it's much better for the miner to go to developed countries. Well, what do you think about that? Up until May of this year, China had around 60 to 70 percent of the Bitcoin network hash rate produced within China. Um, and that has since uh, left, since the ban in China, but we're seeing, unfortunately, most of that head to the United States. The United States has the best capital markets, they have the best infrastructure, and so it's the easiest path for a miner to go set up in Texas or Nebraska or Kentucky. Um, and so I think us as Bitcoiners need to work to combat that in multiple ways and for, re for a couple of reasons. It's really important that the network is decentralized. If one country owns more than 50% of the network, then we might as well be using our fiat banking systems. Yep. And so the, every country having uh, representation at this new governance of our global financial system being Bitcoin is extremely important. Um, I think there's a ton of opportunities and challenges across developing nations when it comes to Bitcoin mining, and we're trying to work on uh, solving some of those challenges. I think the one we're very focused on right now is access to capital markets. Yep. You see American companies raising absurd amount of monies for Bitcoin mining. Mar Marathon just announced $650 million uh, debt deal to expand their mining farm. That's probably more money than the entire LATAM mining community has invested this year. And so access to capital markets, especially through public markets, I think is gonna be key for Latin American miners to expand their operations, as well as private financings. Uh, North American miners can go to private debt providers and. Uh, get ASIC financing, whereas Latin American miners don't have that option yet. And so at Luxor, we're working very closely with some of these financiers to educate them on uh, Paraguay, other, other places in Latin America, Venezuela, um, to look and, and really get them comfortable investing in this region, because that's how I think Latin America will expand in Bitcoin mining and be a, a key player in the future uh, Bitcoin network. Great, great. Well, investment, money, at the end, technically, it's all about our main resource as miners, that is energy. And uh, talking about energy, Daniel, uh, and energy and resources, uh, one of the most important is hardware. So, because technically it's our main tool for working. Uh, but you know there are some urban legend related to, to miners and uh, on the mining ecosystem about the firmware, you know, like, uh, it decreased ASIC lifespan. So, from your work, from your day-to-day, -day, what do you think about that? So, for people who don't know, the firmware is kind of like the operating system that runs on, on the ASICs. It's like the iOS for your iPhone or Android for your uh, Samsung phone. Um, the, the firmware is a really important component for miners because it's independent from the capital expenditure meaning that when they purchase the hardware, uh, they're, they're receiving a machine with an expected amount of production in, in terms of computing power. Um, but when, when they change the firmware on it, they can actually change the performance of the hardware. The most common way that most miners do that is actually increasing the computing power so that they're mining more Bitcoins per unit of energy that they're consuming. Overclocking. Overclocking, yes. Uh, and, and there's a stigma that comes with overclocking that you're gonna break more machines faster and you're going to uh, decrease the lifespan over time because you're running them hotter. Uh, when, you, when you consume energy, it doesn't get destroyed, it gets turned into heat. So doing those computations is just converting the watts into heat output. And when you do that with silicon, and it expands the silicon, and the amount of times that you do that, it decreases the lifespan of the hardware. Um, so this is, this is a big battle for us because we are one of the larger third-party firmware providers around the world, and we're trying to help miners improve their efficiency. But a lot of miners think firmware equals overclocking. And this, I do. Yeah, this isn't actually the case. Firmware equals customization. In our case, 
if you want, say you have an Antminer S9, it's the, the machines from originally released in 2016, they consume on average about 1,200 watts, uh, and, and with that 1,200 watts, they would produce about 13.5 terahash. Uh, if you install our firmware onto them, you can take it down to 800 watts if you want. You can undervolt them, and okay. you actually increase the efficiency really significantly. So the efficiency of an Antminer S9 with the, the original Antminer firmware on it is about 88 watts per terahash. That means that, wow. so per 88 watts, you're producing one terahash of computing power. If you install our firmware and you go down to, say, eight or 900 watts, then you end up with an efficiency closer to 70 watts per terahash. You actually increase both the efficiency in the short term the amount of bitcoins that you're producing per watt of energy that you consume, and you increase the lifespan because you're running them cooler and more safely. But at the same time, if you want to make as much bitcoin as you can, you can overclock. And that's, that's also made safer with, with third-party firmware that does auto-tuning because it's sending frequencies and voltages to the chips that is uh, calibrated specifically for the quality of that particular machine. It's treating each machine as an individual and optimizing it for the silicon quality and, and all of the hardware architecture. So firmware is not about um, overclocking only on its own. Most of our miners, for example, in Venezuela are doing the opposite. They're underclocking, they're using their energy more efficiently and they're Great. preserving the lifespan of their S9 so that maybe even after the next halving in 2024, they'll still be mining with Antminer S9s. And going back to the energy... Hello? Yep. Hello? Try. No. Test, uh, test. I think it's... Okay, it's okay. back. Going back to the energy consumption FUD, um, with... with M many of the nuanced uh, arguments against energy consumption is that the hardware is gone in one or two years, and this is a super outdated uh, talking point. Okay. Yep. We have some problem with batteries here to technical support. <laughs> that. Okay, well, um, I, that's really quite interesting. I think, Daniel, maybe after the conference we have to talk a little bit because mm -hmm. we have a lot of miners to set up uh, in Venezuela with brains. So let's keep continue to the other topic. But technically, you know, firmware is related to lifespan. And talking about lifespan, right now we are receiving a block reward of 6.125 BTC every 10 minutes. But only in 12 years in the future, that amount is going to decrease because of the halving issue, right? To 0 0.78, 7815 per block. Almost the same current amount for fee mining that we, the user of the blockchain, are paying. So, Rosello, don't you think that mining industry have a small window with a, some kind of clock that is making tick tack, tick tack? that or you enter right now or you're going to lose the train. So, you know what I, I think on that one every time when I see that? I think is Satoshi Nakamoto saying, we are against greedy, we are against centralization. That's what it is. Because this is a very good opportunity. Right now, we're gonna see a bunch of VC funds putting a lot of money on mine. I'm not against them. Good for them, they are making, but there is a period of time for them. That's good. Then, just think, the families in Venezuela, you can buy in the market S9, S11, S7, because your energy in your country is close to zero. Yeah, too cheap. It will be the next support for the blockchain technology. Great. That simple. The way it was created, I know for sure, maybe in 20 years' time, the Bitcoin mining will go back as was in the old days. Someone with two machines or three machines mining it because it's not enough money on the network to pay for it. Maybe the miners are going to mine something else. Maybe they're going to do something else. 
But I think in the next 12 years or the next 16 years, let's put it this way, it's going to be centralized. I'm not seeing a way to, to change this. Will be centralized. Centralized? Centralized. All right. I think it will be 20 guys in the world controlling the mining. Okay, but that's it. But and then after this period, for sure, we will see a lot of people all over the world with four, five, ten machines mining cryptocurrency. All right. That's how I see the future. And the opportunity right now for who is in El Salvador, get two mining machines, join a pool. And we're going to make a little, but we need you guys in the future. Because today, only the big boys they can play with. But tomorrow, we're going to need those guys. The people that actually can have two or three machines at home. So I think it's a payback from Satoshi Nakamoto. That's, that's my view. Yeah, I, at the end, it's all game theory, right? Exactly. So, uh, figures, decentralization, uh, sovereignty. Uh, at the end, the whole security of the network relies over mining. And uh, with the same question, Ethan, what do you think? 12 years in the future is, is just the next corner, but we, we, are, we are not fortune tellers, but centrally, in, in the future, maybe miners are going to receive less, less than they are receiving right now. But I am going to add something. For, for example, in Venezuela, I have two nodes. One that is running in my house and another and then a set it, a satellital node that is also running. And then I, I, I am not receiving a penny for that. Okay, I am just giving the guarantee that the whole network is completely safe, is decentralized. So could be miners in the future talking about block reward have the same way of thinking? So I guess Taking a step back from, from purely mining, looking at the Bitcoin protocol, it, it is designed to be a deflationary asset where at the beginning you're mining 50 BTC per block and we're now at 6.25 and we're going to be heading down to zero new block reward in 2140 uh, in 120 years from now. Um, and I think that's a crucial part of why we're all here for Bitcoin. Uh, if you look at the general economies around the world, they're on the opposite trend printing more and more money every year, whereas the Bitcoin block reward will be decreasing every four years. And so I think that's going to give a lot of underlying value to the overall Bitcoin network. Um, and so as miners, uh, yes, you're earning less in Bitcoin over time, and eventually uh, you're heading close to zero block reward and only compensated through transaction fees. Uh, but I think ultimately we're in this business because we think that that structure alone is what's going to uh, cause a really strong increase in, in the price of Bitcoin. And so if you look at how many people are competing for the Bitcoin network, that directly correlates to how much is the Bitcoin network rewarding those people for competing. And so uh, as long as Bitcoin price continues to do well, I think people are still going to be willing to uh, contact TSMC to build ASICs. Uh, and then buy those ASICs from people, set up large mining farms, and then spend on electricity to secure this network. So as long as you're um, kind of thinking that this uh, deflationary schedule of Bitcoin will ultimately benefit the network, then I don't think miners have anything to worry about. It's going to continue to be profitable for the foreseeable future. Do you think the same, Daniel? Yeah. If price doubles every four years, then the block reward in fiat terms is yep. not really... Uh, it's not going to be a problem for miners like and price has been going up about 170 or 180 percent on average every year Which is far more than double every four years So at, at the current pace that we've been seeing it's not going to be a problem anytime soon and then on top of that eventually uh, Transaction fees should account for a larger and more larger portion of mining revenue and that's that's good for the network because it's good for the world because it means that uh, the utility that Bitcoin is providing to people is directly correlated to the amount of money that the miners are making. If people are not using Bitcoin, then Bitcoin will eventually go away and it won't consume ener any energy. And if people continue to use it and they're willing to pay miners to continue to confirm their transactions, then miners will be, will be consuming energy, but they're doing so because they're providing value to people. 
Okay, and okay. I, I want to just add one thing on that. And remember, technology is evolving all the time. Yeah. Remember the first uh, ASIC chips was what, uh, 25? More la, more la, yeah. Right, so now we are six nanom nanometers. So five. Five yeah. nanometers. So as you can see, technology also will improve along the way. So probably in 40 years time or 10 years time, the chips are going to be using less energy. So it's not going to be, you don't spend that much money energy anymore. So many of you might can carry on. But I think the most important part is what happened with all those machines that are not profitable anymore. That's where the rest of the people has a chance. Okay. To be part of Venezuela. Exactly. Uh, Argentina. Argentina. Exactly. Yeah. That's great. I, I, I am thinking right now in something that is a completely uh, no spoken before this, but talking about fees and uh, we miners who receive the payment for, for uses of the, of the network, what do, you, what do you think shortly uh, about L2 layers, like Lightning Network, where, okay, we don't, we don't need miners, so, okay, sorry for the Lightning Labs team <laughs> here, but, you know, what do you think, any of you? It's a, it's a topic we, uh, we discuss a lot with investors and, and uh, people looking to get into the mining space because uh, the Bitcoin community really hypes up Lightning Network, but if uh, you take it at face value, what it does is it takes volume uh, off-chain, right? And so um, if you just look at it with that lens, then miners are making less transaction fees and getting paid less. Uh, but, but I think the more nuanced way to look at it, it is it's a development for Bitcoin. Uh, it's a very good feature, as we've all experienced here in El Salvador, buying through the Lightning Network. And I think it will drive adoption of Bitcoin further in the world, which will increase its overall usage and actually increase transaction fees uh, through higher adoption. So I, I, I think things like Lightning will actually benefit miners in the long term. And uh, what, what I think is like competition is always good, right? When yeah, markets. Before, remember the SegWit thing. The block was one mag and was no pressure. Then everybody started to put pressure on it, saying we need uh, a bigger block, we need a bigger block, we need this, we need that. So then, while well, someone, well, have nothing against him, like Roger Ver, was a guy who says, if you guys don't want to change, let's create a new one. Then put pressure on it. And because that pressure, like, we need to get second with it on right there, right now. Yeah. Look at that route. Same situation, other coins has the whole facility as uh, be anonymous and Bitcoin does not. Now, pressure again, tap root in place. So, lightning is a, just a new way to force, uh, to change the protocol, to get a better and better. And as when you see the white paper from Satoshi Nakamoto, it's always saying if the majority decide to change, the change must be applied. So that is going to be beautiful. What I think Lightning doing is just saying to the, to the Bitcoin core, you better guys change something, otherwise we take over. So it's just a competition. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah that's why uh, all that hard forks has been so unsuccessful, right? So but let, let's get to the point. I, I would reiterate something that you okay, okay, said in, in a kind of different way, but... Um, you know, Ethan and I are in some sense competitors. We we run similar products, slush pool and and Luxor pool. Um, but at the end of the day, if if Bitcoin succeeds, then Bitcoin miners succeed, and Bitcoin miners are the most long Bitcoin of any entity in the entire ecosystem. Like they're they're basically a leveraged position on Bitcoin's future. So. Um, when I, when I look at Ethan and what Lux are doing, and I see them doing really great things, it's it's not like a thing of like, oh, their gain is our loss. If they're doing the good things for the Bitcoin ecosystem, and so are we, then then the Bitcoin ecosystem is going to continue to evolve in a good direction, and that's good for all the miners, and it's good for us. So the Lightning Network, the Lightning Network is the same thing. The Lightning Network is good for the the users of Bitcoin because we can't fit a billion transactions into each block. It's just not feasible with bandwidth requirements and data storage requirements. Yep. But if we can enable payments to actually occur with Bitcoin, we can enable entire countries to start using it uh, with basically free and instantaneous payments. And at the same time, we as miners can continue to secure the main chain and we continue to earn transaction fees, then it's, it's great for us. 
uh, if it increases the utility of Bitcoin, then it's good for Bitcoin miners. And of course, it's good for all of us, the millions of people that Bitcoin have to reach. So le let's go. We are technically just running out of time. Yeah. Um, let's go with, with one final question. And let's go back to society, okay? Uh, I was searching some information because of this panel, and uh, the United Nations Conference on Climate Change held in Glasgow last week recognized the complex environmental situation for our planet and the urgent measures that we have to take as a society, especially in global warming, you know? So, considering that Bitcoin use a certain amount of energy base and CO2, uh, one of the most polluting compounds, how could the mother of all cryptocurrencies help to defeat this threat? Daniel, let's begin with you. Um, I think the first thing to realize about Bitcoin mining is that the energy consumption doesn't really tell us that much about the environmental impact. In my opinion, the cleanest use case for Bitcoin mining, the, the best use case for the environment of Bitcoin mining is using a fossil fuel, which is waste gas, uh, which is all over the world, but in particular in North America and Canada and the US. There's enough gas being flared and vented into the atmosphere, which is, it's just pure methane. Methane is about 25 times worse for the, the environment over a 100 year time span than CO2. Yep. And that's just being flared into the, into the atmosphere. The reason that, that that's happening is because it's a byproduct of oil extraction and oil extraction is extremely profitable. So even though that's an externality of it, people are going to continue to do it because we, we use oil for everything. So oil is really important. And uh, as long as there's that financial incentive to continue extracting oil, there will be a lot of natural gas that's also being extracted. And we need to do something with it. Right now, the main thing that we do with it is just burn it into the atmosphere and it's just releasing methane and, and CO2. But if, if the flare stack is inefficient, for example, then methane is seeping out from that and that's damaging the environment at a really severe rate. And we can power the entire Bitcoin network multiple times over right now just with natural gas that's being flared and vented into the atmosphere. So the, the whole, like, we need renewable energy, we need um, solar panels and wind farms and, and all this stuff. It's good to see technological, technological development of these, uh, like, these different energy sources. Uh, it's being built out all across the world. But at the same time, it, it doesn't tell the full story. We need to have some nuance about uh, environmental impact is not directly correlated to the amount of energy being consumed. Yep. And in fact, it can be the opposite. If we had the entire network running on gas that would otherwise be flared and vented, then Bitcoin is carbon negative. Okay, great. World leaders are watching this right now to take note. Yep. So, Ethan. One minute for you, one minute for you, Rosella Ferrandin. Yeah, we could rift on this topic all night, but uh, I, I love the use case that Daniel just outlaid with uh, flared gas. Great. Um, one of the other interesting use cases right now is for renewable development. Renewable is majority intermittent energy, so during certain periods of the day, it's producing more than others. And you're starting to see that right now in places like Texas and the ERCOT grid. They're making a huge effort to put wind energy there, and it's leading to some issues on that grid. Uh, and Bitcoin miners are one of the perfect use cases for dealing with that issue. Uh, they can come in, use energy when there's a surplus, and then immediately turn their machines off uh, when it's needed by uh, the grid for heating homes and, and whatnot. So uh, at Luxor, we work with a lot of uh, companies that are directly adding value to these grids, to renewable energy projects, and I think it's going to fuel more money into greenfield renewable projects and make them more viable. So I think Bitcoin's going to enable uh, renewable energy development across the world. Great. Well, Rosella. Uh, I like, uh, well, those two guys said everything, uh, <laughs> but I, I think it's, uh, it's really nice and as an opportunity. For example, some places that they have no uh, uh, network, uh, electricity network connection, uh, it's possible for some countries to have, like, let's say, for example, solar panels, and then those solar panels, they can be mining cryptocurrency only with a, 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 a satellite connection for the internet. They can actually 
generate money from it. So if you are in the middle of the desert or if you are in a location that you have sun, exposure to the sun for 12 hours a day, and but you do not have connection to the electricity, there we go. So you can convert that in something. So I think using this possibility, this kind of uh, energy that you can generate, I think is the, is the nice future that we can use. Great, thank you guys. Muchísimas gracias, thank you guys for this incredible panel.